is brought to you by Head Start Basketball. If you can make something competitive, and I love like the thought of stacking wins day after day after day after day and stacking just individual wins, like win today. And that's a mindset, like win this choice. Gabe Miller is in his sixth year as a men's basketball assistant coach at Loras College in Iowa. Miller came to Loras prior to the 2016 season after two seasons as the assistant coach at Judson University in Elgin, Illinois. Under head coach Chris Martin, Miller serves as the primary recruiting coordinator as well as overseeing the strength and conditioning program. During his time with the Dewhawks, Gabe has helped coach the team to the 2017 Iowa Intercollegiate Athletic Conference Championship and the NCAA Division III Sweet 16 in 2019. The Dewhawks have also finished in the top three of the conference each of the past five seasons. As a college basketball player at Anderson University, Miller helped the Ravens to a conference championship and an appearance in the NCAA tournament. In addition, Miller was a two-time all-conference selection and ranks in the top ten all-time in career assists and steals. Hey, hoop heads. I wanted to take a minute to shout out our partners and friends at Dr. Dish Basketball. Their Dr. Dish shooting machines are undoubtedly the most advanced and user-friendly machines on the market. Sign up now for their virtual camp 2.0 featuring 10 days of workouts with pro trainers from the Dr. Dish family. Learn more at drdishbasketball.com and follow their incredible content at Dr. Dish B-Ball on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. Mention the Hoopheads podcast and save an extra $300 on the Dr. Dish Rebel, All-Star, and CT models. Visit drdishbasketball.com for details. That's a great deal, Hoopheads. Get your Dr. Dish shooting machine today. Hi, this is J.P. Clark, former NBA assistant coach with the Celtics and Clippers, and you're listening to the Hoop Heads podcast. Prepare like the pros with the all-new FastDraw and Fast Scout. FastDraw has been the number one play diagramming software for coaches for years. You'll quickly see why Fast Model Sports has the most compelling and intuitive basketball software out there. For a limited time, Fast Model is offering Hoop Heads listeners 15% off Fast Draw and Fast Scout. Just use the code HHP15 at checkout to grab your discount and you'll be on your way to more efficient game prep and improved communication with your team. Fast Model also has new coaching content every week on its blog, plus play and drill diagrams on its play bank. Check out the links in the show notes for more. Fast Model Sports is the best in basketball. If you're looking to improve your coaching, please consider joining the Hoopheads Mentorship Program. We believe that having a mentor is the best way to maximize your potential and become a transformational coach. By matching you up with one of our experienced mentors, you'll develop a one-on-one relationship that will help your coaching, your team, your program, and your mindset. The Hoopheads Mentorship Program delivers mentoring services to basketball coaches at all levels through our team of experienced head coaches. Find out more at hoopheadspod.com or shoot me an email directly. Mike at hoopheadspod.com. Follow us on social media at hoopheadspod on Twitter and Instagram, and be sure to check out the Hoopheads Podcast Network for more great basketball content. Are you tired of overpaying for your video and analytics platform? Well, it's time to check out quickcut.com, a platform built by coaches for coaches. Quickcut is undeniably more affordable, it's all cloud based and comes packed with features to help high schools and youth programs store, share, and analyze game film. Make the switch, get double the storage, and save your program up to 50% on the fastest growing video editing system in the country. For more information or to request a free trial, visit quickcut.com slash basketball. That's Q-W-I-K-C-U-T dot com. Make sure you have a notebook ready as you listen to this episode with Gabe Miller men's basketball assistant coach at Loras College in the state of Iowa. Hello and welcome to the Hoop Heads Podcast. It's Mike Cleansing here without my co-host Jason Sunkel tonight, but I am pleased to be joined by Gabe Miller, the associate men's basketball coach at Loras College. Gabe, welcome to the Hoop Heads Pod. Mike, hey, I appreciate you having me on tonight. Looking forward to it. Excited to have you on. Looking forward to diving in, learning more about you and your career. And I want to start by going back in time to when you were a kid, Tell us a little bit about how you got introduced to the game. What are some of your first experiences that you remember? 
Yeah, definitely. Um, it, it's funny to just sit here and think back and, you know, try to figure out the important people in my life or the important situations or whatever happened. You know, I grew up in Southern Indiana and when, when you hear people who are from Indiana, they always, you know, see pictures of, you know, snowy driveways and shoveling <laughs> things and getting shots up or whatever the case is like Indiana, like that's what you do, right? Like basketball was it. And, um, I, I was fortunate enough to be raised, uh, by two awesome parents and I had, I'm one of five boys in a family. So I have three older brothers who, um, basketball and sports and, um, that, that's how I was introduced to it. That's, that's what it was. And, um, I remember going to, you know, elementary games and high school games and junior high games and college games and sitting in the bleachers and watching my older brothers play and, you know, right or wrong that I was almost destined to play basketball or basketball be a part of my life. And, um, so that was a fun part of, of just growing up and getting beat on. And, you know, when we get together for the holidays or, um, when, when all of us, all of our brothers can get together, like we just tell stories and we're so competitive and we just rag on each other. And we talk about, you know, that one time I beat you one-on-one or that one time that, you know, one of my older brothers, I stole it from him out on the back court and he shoved me into the, you know, the pole and chip my tooth. And <laughs> like, those are the stories that we're, we remember and we talk about and like, yeah, it's all fun and games and everything, but there was a competitive competitiveness to us growing up. And, um, it was a lot of fun. And like I said, like, that's what we do in Indiana and, you know, early on, that's, that's what it was. And, um, so getting introduced to basketball, um, was, was pretty easy, <laughs> safe to say, that's for sure. <laughs> Were you and your brothers right on the edge of crazy? Cause I know I have, friends that I grew up with that just about any family that has only boys and has more than two, it just seems like, man, those houses get crazy with people going super competitive and just where you're almost right on the edge of, yeah, it's competitive. And then sometimes it flips over from being competitive to like, I'm really legitimately trying to like beat the tar out of you. I, I mean, I think crazy is almost sitting it lightly, right? <laughs> um, I, I say this often. And when I, when I tell people that I'm one of five, like my mom was a saint and, you know, bless her heart. And she, she did some awesome things and she put up with some crazy situations and some crazy stories. And, you know, if I, if I had a, a dollar for every time I heard, just wait until your dad gets home, you know, that type of situation of whether it was us fighting each other or, um, us, you know, telling on each other, or punching the other guy, or whatever the case was, <laughs> like it's, it was, it was crazy then. And it's still crazy now with, you know, kids running around and babies now. And, um, so it's cool to see full circle, just what it's like and the competitiveness that can be, um, drawn out of each other for sure. Your, parent, your parents have any granddaughters yet? They do. Yeah. All yeah, right. They nice. Do. Their first All one right. was a granddaughter. So All right, there um, you go. They, they've got a handful. Yeah, I know my mom was loving that. I bet your mom was sure. happy. Yeah, for sure. She was. She yeah, could fry, yeah, finally definitely. go to the, finally go to the store and buy some girls clothes. <laughs> <laughs> no doubt about it. No doubt about it. <laughs> All right. So you mentioned that you played other sports. Were, were you, uh, at what point did you start to zero in on basketball or were you a multi-sport athlete when it get, when you got to high school? Yeah, I grew up in a, in a small uh, town. So I went to a small high school. So, you know, we didn't have football. Um, so, you know, growing up, it was basketball. Um, it was basketball and baseball. And then um, we all did tennis for the fun of it. And it was nice. more so it's almost like you do tennis just to, you know, quote unquote, get in shape for the basketball season. And then after basketball, you flow right into the baseball season. So, um, you know, the growing up, the youth leagues of the basketball and baseball, those were the big things. And that's what it was um, you know, a typical route for the year for kids, you know, that we would hang out with. And we knew that we were going to play summer baseball. And we knew right after summer baseball, we were going to go right into tennis. And then from tennis, we were going to go into the basketball season. So it was full circle, pretty uh, scheduled out and everything. Um, you know, I knew deep down um, early on, I had the opportunity. One of my older brothers played college basketball at uh, Franklin in Indiana. And I remember just growing up and going to his games and watching and traveling. And that was when I was like, I want to do this. I want to play college basketball. Um, and that was one of the biggest impacts of my life was watching him. And he had a successful career and, you know, he, he set some high school records and um, was pretty successful at the college level as well. But I just remember, you know, traveling to the games with my family and with 
uh, people from the town and just the excitement that that brought them. And that was the itch that like, yeah, I want to do this, you know, actually seeing college basketball and experiencing that um, as a, as a kid and a few years out. Uh, that's where I really got the desire to continue moving on um, to play college ball. How did that translate watching your brother and I'm sure having conversations with him, how did that translate into what you did to work and improve and become a better player so that you might have the opportunity to play college basketball after your high school career was over? Yeah, definitely. So it, it really, it started my, you know, sixth and seventh grade years. Um, you know, I was blessed, you know, fortunate enough to play on a team that we didn't lose a game uh, my fifth grade, sixth grade, seventh grade, or eighth grade year. So we were like, 90 some and oh leading into my freshman year of high school and my sixth grade year i was actually the um, ball boy the manager uh, <laughs> whatever it is for our for the high school varsity team so i traveled on the bus i you know went to the practices i did the water bottles i did everything and my older brother was a was a senior that year and uh so we they actually won a sectional championship for the first time in school history so like i was just involved and absorbed into that and i get to see you know the type of work ethic. I remember him coming home from, you know, lifting as a senior in high school and drinking protein shakes and watching him do all this stuff. And like, then that was translating to a successful high school career. And then him, you know, committing to college and the, the habits that he was creating and that he was, um, you know, instilling that he didn't realize I was watching really paid off. And that, you know, looking back now, I'm like, yeah, like, Early on, you know, and I, I'm, I'm a big habits guy and a big routine guy and just the impact that those can have on your life. Like that's, that's a huge influence, right? Like you see that now as a father, you know, that, that plays a huge role into, you know, the, the types of conversations that I have with, with my kids or the, the impact that we can have on our guys now. Like even though, you know, it might not be a direct conversation, what you're doing and what people see plays a huge role in it. Absolutely. Growing up in small town Indiana, did you, I'm assuming, play with the same group of kids from the time you were little? You pretty much knew who your high school teammates were. Yeah. Would be. Yep. Exactly. So I knew, you know, we had a really good uh, group of guys um, that played. AAU wasn't huge. It was just starting to take off a little bit when I got into high school. But from you know third, fourth, fifth up up until my freshman year, where you know as a freshman you 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 can move out to like junior varsity or varsity or whatever the case is. Like we played together and, you know, we had one of our uh, buddies, dads was the coach. And um, so that was pretty consistent. And yeah, maybe a kid moved in or moved out or whatever, but you know, on senior night of our high school year, there's a group of, you know, five or six of us that had been together since our fifth grade year, which was really exciting. That's for sure. Yeah, absolutely. What's your favorite memory when you think back to your high school playing career? Does one or two things stand out for you? Yeah, there's, you know, kind of, I, I would say two things. So um, I was fortunate enough again. So my old, older brother who played college ball, he graduated. And then I have another older brother who's two years older than myself. So as a sophomore, um, I was starting as the, as the point guard on the varsity team and, uh, we had a pretty good season and um, we were playing in the semi-state game. And this is the farthest that, you know, our school had ever been. And we got beat in the semi-state on a last second tip in and just the devastation that that oh. brought um, <laughs> because yes, we just got beat and how close we were to reaching the state championship. But, you know, my brother was on the team as a senior and he was never going to play, you know, he wasn't going to play college ball or anything, but I just remember, you know, after that game, there's a picture of me, you know, kneeled over at the half court line, just, just sobbing. Like, yeah, we lost and that stung, but just the, the fact that I was never going to get to play basketball with him again. Um, that was a big part of it. And then the following year, um, we had the opportunity and, um, just things worked out. We were blessed. We we won a state championship my junior year. Um, and the morning of our state championship game, my older brother who graduated the year before wrote me a, a handwritten note on a post-it and put it in the bathroom um, before we left on the bus. And I just remember, and he's just like, you know, it said, Gabe, like, I'm so proud of you. This is awesome. Go win a state championship. And like, it meant more to win a state championship 
um, because of the, the experience that we had the year before of getting so close. You know, they talk about the taste of, you know, victory is so sweet when you can, you know, taste defeat a little bit, right? Like, um, that, that was a big part of, of the high school season and the experience of, yeah, the joy of not many people can win a state championship and to win a state championship in Indiana. Um, that's even a little bit more special, I'd say. It's super interesting to me that the first thing you mentioned is the loss. Obviously, chronologically, it makes sense. Yeah. But I also think that when you have an opportunity to have been a successful player, and obviously you were at the high school level and the college level, you don't lose as you know you don't lose very often. And so yeah. those losses, I always say that and I won a lot of games, but the losses are the ones that really stick with me. And if you ask me that same question, I have a couple of good moments, mm. but I have a couple of I have a couple of losses that I rank those as, I don't know that they're my, I don't know that they're my favorite memories, but when you ask me for what's my most vivid memory or what things do I think about most when it comes to my high school career, I definitely think about those losses. And I think it's always interesting to get that question of, do you love to win more or do you hate to lose? And I think it's a, it's not an easy question to answer, yeah. but I think when I think about my own memories and I think about the things that stick with me. You know, I put myself in the, I think the hate to mm. lose category more than that, yeah. more than, more than the love to win. And obviously you love to win, but man, yeah, exactly. th those losses stick with you. Exactly right. Exactly right. I think it was, uh, Kobe Bryant in one interview, um, he was kind of, they were, they were kind of getting to that question, right? Do you, uh, you know, the love to win or hate to lose type of thing. And he's just like, what is failure? Like there's like failures, a, a like that's all in your imagination, right? Like a loss is, is still an opportunity to learn. And that, that's a huge part. And I think that's, that's why sports are so awesome and so different than anything else because of the, the fact that they can teach individuals so much about life. And, you know, now coaching, right? You can lose a game and yeah, you can get mad and, you know, it, it's on your record forever, but like there's lessons to be learned, right? Like whether it was your game day prep, whether it was decision making, whether it was, the conversation you had with the referee or the conversation you had with the player or whatever the case is like, there's so many lessons that you can learn, you know, and you can do that in wins too. I, don't get me wrong, but you know, it's, there's something about a loss that, you know, almost makes you just really evaluate a little bit more um, than what you might typically do. And as much as a loss hurts, yeah, it's not like a loss necessarily in real life that can have, mm -hmm. You know, not that it doesn't have a real impact on your life, because as coaches and players, we know that those <laughs> yep. losses do yep. have a real impact on your life. But you can bounce back from those. You lose, you lose game twelve of your season, and your season's not over. You can come back, and you get another opportunity to play. And and those life lessons, I think, are are really, really important. I'm curious, how, how old are your kids? Are they are they playing sports yet? Oh, uh, they're uh, crew. Um... Our first, he's three years old, and then right. Fletcher is one. So, we're so, you're, just, so you're not, so you're not there yet. Not yet. We're, we're crew is uh, really digging into basketball right now. Cool. Um, we we do a lot of imagination and games, and we've got our you know the the hoop set up inside, and um, so it, it's fun. He's starting to really um, pick it up a little bit, but I it, nothing's pushed right. Like you're just yep. wanting him to enjoy it and. Um, and, and just have fun with it. I can preview for, I can preview it for you. It's going to be, it's going to be, it's going to be fun and it's going to be challenging as you go through if they, if they end up playing hoops, because I just found with my own kids and this is a question that, or just something I've talked with other coaches about. It's interesting, you know, when we're talking about teaching life lessons and using the game and how much losing hurts and how much you enjoy winning. And, you know, it's funny, I'll be coaching my kids and I have a, my daughter's a senior now, my son's a sophomore and I have another daughter's in sixth grade. And so I've coached them all at various levels and whatever. And as a coach, when we play a game and we lose and I'm just, as you know, you get totally wrapped up in it and you look back and what could we have done differently and this and that. And then as each of them have gotten up, older where I'm not coaching them and then I'm sitting in the stands and as a parent I want them to do well and I hope their team wins and I hope they play well but a minute after that game's over like I'm no longer invested in the result of the yeah. game it's like yeah. I'm just I'm just happy for them but as a coach man those things those things stick with you so it's just interesting yeah. as you know you got that parent versus that coach sort exactly. of perspective depending on where you're at and just it's amazing how much easier it is to detach when I'm just a parent as opposed to I'm 
the coach of that team as well. So there you go. There you go. There you go. What's the, do you, any, any, uh, any piece of advice on that as, as he gets older? Yeah. I mean, I think, I think don't the biggest coach thing, him or coach no, no, him no, or no. I, I think you definitely want to coach him. Okay. I think you definitely want to coach him. And here's why I think what I always found is, and again, this goes to, I always wanted to coach him in basketball. I coached my son a little bit with baseball. I did it for a year or two. And then I got out simply because I didn't feel like I was adding a tremendous amount of baseball value. Yeah. And I also thought he needed to hear a different voice. But with basketball, and I'm sure you can speak to this to some degree, you know, you see there's all different types of coaching that a kid can be, you know, that a kid can get involved with. And with basketball, I felt like because I could bring some knowledge of the game and then I also knew that I could create the kind of environment that I wanted him to be in from a basketball standpoint, I felt like that was important. So I always coached all my kids. I coached okay. my, my daughters, coached my, coached my son. Uh, and then I think the other piece of it that I've always, I don't know if struggled with, but I think I know that the way that I handled it was the right way to handle it, but yeah. it's really difficult. And what I mean by that is as a basketball guy, I always felt like, I want, and I was a kid that, like, I could never get enough. I was on my driveway all the time. By the time I was, you know, 13, I was hopping on my bike and riding down to the park and playing with yeah. high school and college yeah. and adult guys. And then by the time I could drive or my friends could drive, we were driving all over the city to find games and doing this and that. And I was just a kid that, you know, I just loved it. And yeah. none of my, none of my three kids have been wired like that. So, it was difficult, probably more difficult with my son than my daughter, just because, again, I probably relate to his experience more than I related to my, wow. my daughter's sports experience. But with my kids, what I found to be the most challenging piece of it is how much do you push? And there are times where I'm going to the gym and part of me would want to be like, come on, man, you got to go. I'd always ask. But if he said no, I would kind of walk out of the house a little disgruntled. Yeah. But I always held my tongue and didn't make any of the kids go to something that they didn't want to go to. So sometimes they would go, but there were a lot of times that they didn't. And as a yeah. father and as somebody who was wired the way I was wired, that was really, really hard for me. And I would see other parents, other dads, and they'd kind of have their kid, they'd be dragging them around or they'd have a kid who was more like me who wanted to go to all this stuff. And part of me is like, oh, man, I wish, you know, I wish my son was more like that. Or I wish my daughter was more like that, that they wanted to just tag along to the gym mm. every time I went. And they just weren't. And my son's now a sophomore. And at the end of his eighth grade year, all of a sudden, that light went back on huh. or, or came on for the first yeah. time. And he just started Hey, dad, can you take me? Can we go shoot? Can we do this? Can, you know, can you put together some workouts for me? Can we do? And it was just like he went from being completely one direction to completely going in the other direction. Wow. And it's just been a really interesting journey to see where, like, he was a kid who always played hard, always worked hard in practice, was super coachable, but just didn't have, and I tell people all the time, like, he just doesn't have, he's just not wired and driven to, go and get better outside of the things that are quote required. Yeah. And then all of a sudden when he started doing that and you start seeing the improvement and you start seeing a little bit of that passion come in. And as a father, you kind of look at it and you're like, okay, I think, I think I did it right because you wonder if I'm dragging him to stuff when he's eight, nine, 10 years old, one, does he eventually hate the game? And two, does he eventually get sick of dad dragging him to all these places that he didn't want to go to. So it was really hard yeah. to, to not push, mm. but I really feel like in the end I made the, the best decision because one, the relationship is solid. And yeah. two, as you know, if a kid's not going to work at it on their own, if they're only working at it because their coach tells them to, or because their dad tells them to, or their mom drags them somewhere, they're never going to be good enough to do anything anyway. It has to come from them. And so even though it was really difficult, I guess the advice that I'd give you and I'd give any parent is just provide as many opportunities for your kids to do whatever it is. And then eventually they're going to probably find whatever their passion is. And just like 
my family was a basketball family because of me. So they got a lot more exposure to basketball just because that's what I was doing all the time. And I'm sure it'd be the same for you. So the chances of them finding basketball and liking basketball are, are pretty high. But I think you, if you don't become that crazy overbearing parent who's making your kid do stuff, I think in the long run, you're better off. And again, I'm not a hundred percent sure that's right. Oh yeah. Maybe yeah. if I, maybe if I dragged him to a bunch of stuff, maybe he might've got better sooner and that yeah. passion might've kicked on. So I don't know for sure that I'm right, <laughs> but, but I feel like for, for where we are now, I feel like to some degree yeah. what I did was vindicated. So nice. Yeah. Yeah. I think you can go, you can go many different ways and, you know, whether it's like a the Tiger Woods, you know, childhood story or that or, yep. you know, whatever that is. Like there's so many different routes that you can go and there's no right or wrong way. And it's, it's your way. Yep. And, you know, if that's what you feel is right, like do it. And, yep. you know, that, like you said, you got to it, like the intrinsic versus extrinsic motivation. For sure. And, um, it's, you know, at the end of the day, it's what that, what each individual is passionate about and what they want to do and where they find joy and, you know, where they can you know, feel like they can be themselves. And I think that's, that's the key to it. And that's what parenting is. Forget yeah. about sports. I mean, we're all just flying by the seat of our pants. It doesn't sure. matter. It doesn't yeah. matter what you're doing. You're just Amen. like, Amen. you're like, Hey, I'm trying to, I'm trying to do this right. I think, I think I know what I'm doing. I think I'm making the right decision, but who knows? And you can't go back and cre create an alternative reality and do something different. So you just have yeah, to exactly. you try to, you try to do the best you can. And that's all, exactly. that's all, that's all you can do. All right, let's get back to your playing career. You get an opportunity and have a successful high school career. You've always wanted to play college basketball. What's the recruitment like? What's your decision making process for ending up at Anderson? For sure, yeah. The you know again, I kind of mentioned a little bit ago, like you know AAU wasn't as big, and the recruiting you know recruiting scene was just starting to take off. You know, I, I ended up playing AAU. You know, really diving into a the year uh, after my junior year and um, dug into it. And like, I remember going to AAU tournaments and like playing against some high level names and some, you know, big time coaches. And like, you know, as a, as a small town kid, I'm like, Oh my gosh, like, what is this? And to, to now know what it is now, you know, it, it's just crazy where it kind of started and where it's going to continue to grow. So, you know, going um, into my senior year, I was I was open. The recruiting process was you know was was good, was fine. Coaches were you know calling and they would show up to see you play, and you know text messaging wasn't you know huge then. You know it was more so phone calls and um, handwritten letters or whatever the case was, and then you go visit. And so just just knowing what the recruiting is like now with you know FaceTime or you know, tags or <laughs> calls or whatever to yep. where it was then. And, um, it's just, it's just funny to see it all and the growth of it. So, um, ended up, you know, had some opportunities to, um, walk on at some scholarship schools or to play at the division two level or whatever the case was. And, um, it, that's a, that's kind of a key point in my life is I had committed to a, a division two school and, um, was going up to some some workouts over over the summer and was doing some things and thought that that was the path that I was wanting to go and I had you know it was August of of the year and I'm getting ready to start school in probably two or three weeks right like the the classes were set my schedule was set I was doing some open gym runs with the team and um, for whatever reason I went up one day and you know I, I'm faith is is a big part of my life and there's there's not many other ways that I can tell this story without bringing that into it. But it was just a, it was a matter of, of faith that I, I just had a feeling that that school was not where I was supposed to be. And I left the parking lot that day, didn't go play open gym and went home and told my parents. And I said, Hey, like, I, I'm not supposed to be, that's not the school that I'm supposed to go to. I'm supposed to go to uh, Anderson University for whatever reason. Like I had no idea. Anderson had recruited <laughs> me. Yes. I had told them probably three months ago that I wasn't interested. And I, you know, I, I was 17, 18 years old and I thought it was a lot better than what I was. And, um, you know, division three was below me, quote unquote, that that was my thought. And, you know, during the recruiting process and I just, you know, but I, I had it in my mind. I wanted to play at the highest level for whatever reason. And, um, but you know, 
that that turned out to be wrong. And so made a phone call that afternoon and called uh, the head coach at Anderson, Coach Slider, and I, I told him the situation. And um, he was lucky enough, or I was lucky enough and fortunate enough that um, he made some phone calls to the school and I was able to go up for orientation and get um, my class schedule in, in about a week and moved in two days later. And, um, you know, looking back now, um, it's just crazy because um, my my wife now was a senior at Anderson my freshman year. So it's just funny how it all works out. Like um, <laughs> there was a reason for it, right? Like who knows where life could be and, you know, uh, life is like that. And, you know, the, the decisions that you make impact who you are and the path that you're going to be on. And, um, you know, fortunate enough to have, you know, some strong influence um influential voices in my life that were able to direct me during that. And um, so ended up at Anderson um, as a, that's kind of a long story short, but uh, that's the path that I was able to take. And, you know, the four years at Anderson shaped me for who, who I am and who, you know, the, the type of person that I want to become. Um, it, those were four key years of my life. That's for sure. Did you know right away when you were there, and you got involved in the team with the team and you're going to class. Did, did you know right away that the decision obviously to leave the previous school was the right one? But did you know right away that Anderson, you're like, oh, yeah, this this is this is the right fit for me? I did. Yeah, for sure. It just felt right. Like I knew deep down that that was the staff that I wanted to play for. Um, it's just funny, you know, again, the thinking back to, you know, when I was a sixth, seventh grader and watching my brother play college ball, like. I wanted to play, you know, college basketball for that experience of like to, to make my family proud and make, you know, the town proud and everything. And, you know, that that was the driving force early on in my career. And, you know, I think I think that's important. I do. I think family is, is super important. But until you, you know, truly find your purpose as an individual, like that was the shift for me. And that happened later on in my career at Anderson was like, I'm going to do this for me. Like I want to be successful. Um, I want to find who I am as an individual and, you know, take that route versus trying to please others. And I think, you know, uh, you know, comparisons, the thief of joy. And I think that's a, that's a quote that, um, is written on my wall and something that I live by is like, that, that's, that can take a lot out of you. Like when you're trying to compare your situation yep. to others, like that, that's, there's no good inroad to that. And, um, so I didn't, it didn't matter what others were saying or whatever the route was, or, you know, Oh, you're doing this or you're doing that. Like if you can shut out those voices, I think that's a, that's a huge driving uh, point for your life. That's for sure. Absolutely. I think that's another parenting mantra that I use all the time with my kids and you use it and you try to talk about it. And if you're ever in situations where you see people who are, comparers mm -hmm. and any anybody I, in my life that I know that's a comparer is is never a happy person yeah because even when they have good things that happen to them there's always somebody else that has something better happen to them yeah and I just think that man if you can use that not only with your with your players with yourself but man as a parent if you can instill that ability to just be happy with what you have and to be have a drive to achieve for yourself, not so you can one up somebody else. I think you just have a, you have an, op you have an opportunity to be a lot happier in your life than if you're always looking over your That's shoulder. Right. Let's face it. Look today, right. Compared to when you were playing or when I was playing, you think about social media and what <laughs> kids that are yeah. growing up today, what they have to compare themselves to used to be like, again, who'd you compare to yourself to in high school? Maybe a kid across the, you know, 20 yep. miles away was maybe as far as you had to go to yep. to be the best player and you, you didn't know any better otherwise now you're a kid in southern indiana i mean you know what some kid in california is doing and what offer they have and i can't even imagine what kids today have to go through with all the highlight videos that are out there and all the posts about yeah. got this got this offer and got that offer and just you know the pressure that you feel and your friends saying hey well when that's are you going to get your offer and this and that and I, I can't even imagine what that's like that's right i remember in high school, you know, you play on a Friday night. I remember waking up Saturday morning and walking up our driveway and getting the newspaper to check the scores of <laughs> the teams, you know, 20 minutes away to see right. if they won. Yep. And uh, like, I, I had no idea the, some of the names and the box scores, but, 
you know, just that, that's just funny. Like it's just, it's just how different it is. That's for sure. And that's, and it's not right or wrong. It, it's, correct. it's what we have. Yep. Correct. Right. right. Absolutely. But, um, yeah, that, that's a, uh, that's funny. All right. So when did coaching get on your radar? What, would you study in school? What did you plan to do? Was it, was it always coaching? Was it always staying involved in the game or did coaching not become a thought until after your playing career ends? Yeah. So I went into, uh, into college wanting to be a teacher and I, I wanted to be a uh, English teacher and I wanted to be a high school coach and or that's what I thought I wanted to do. Um, I think the teaching aspect was more so just so I could coach because that's kind of what I had always been told. Right. Um, and then it was in between my sophomore and junior season um, of college that it, it kind of all flipped for me. And that was when I was like, I need to, why am I doing this? And I, I actually told our head coach that I thought I was going to quit and I didn't want to play basketball anymore. And then finally, what I, I don't know exactly what happened or what it was, but the, it, the light bulb turned on and I was like, no, like if I'm going to do this, if I'm going to play college basketball, I need to commit 100%. So I changed my major to uh, exercise science and I learned how to eat right. I learned how to work out. I learned just the, the whole scope of, you know, maximizing your, your ability, the science behind it. Like, you know, you could read everything um, in magazines and whatnot, but um, I wanted to teach myself and wanted to learn and wanted to dig into it and find out okay, I, I need to be eating this two days before our game. I need to be eating this a day before our game, or I need to be taking this before a workout or whatever the case is. And that's when, you know, things really shifted in my life was like, this is what I want to do, right? Like if you want to be great at anything, yep. you know, if you look at the greats and I'm, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a big reader and I love, you know, looking at like the, you know, Kobe Bryant and even, I'm, I'm not a huge LeBron, LeBron guy, but like Elon Musk and, uh, Steve Jobs and those types of individuals, right? Like they have such a uh, limited hobby list. Like they are so narrow focused into what they want to do and what they want to achieve, right? Like if you have, you know, 20 buckets and you're trying to put, you know, a uh, hundred things in those 20 buckets and it's so spread out, like you're not going to be, you know, good at anything, but if you have three buckets, right. And you can have, you know, 25 things here and 30 things here and like really, you know, go into those three things or whatever that is. Um, that's where you can achieve success at the highest level. And that's what I started to learn. Like, okay, I don't need to be doing this. Everybody else can do that. I'm going to do these two or three things. And, um, you know, from eating right to, uh, working out to, you know, extra shots or, you know, digging into my faith or, um, you know, just the uh, narrow minded focus, I think was a, was a huge shift for me. Um, that, and then that shifted, got me into, you know, the, the physical training, the sports specific training and how to, you know, become a better basketball player. And that's where my, my true love of basketball really took off, you know, Growing up, yes, basketball was always a part of my life, but up until that point, um, I think it was all for the, I don't want to say wrong reasons, but it was just what I did. And now it, it shifted to who I am. And that, that's, that was the turning point for me. And then, you know, graduating, um, basketball had been such a part of my life that, you know, I almost pushed it away, right? Like, yeah. um, you know, I graduated and I, we had some successful seasons at Anderson and we, you know, went to the national tournament, won the conference championship and everything. And it was, it was, it was awesome. Right. It was great. Um, played four years and, um, have some awesome relationships and, you know, the coaching staff is, you know, three or four of the strongest mentors of my life currently. And still some awesome people that I talk to, you know, every other day. Um, but, um, you know, it's, it's what you do it and, or it's why you do it, um, is, is the turning point, um, that allowed me to become, yeah, I want to be a coach. Right. And, um, you know, I think my wife was able to speak into that and be like, no, don't push this away. Like, this is who you are. And this is, this is the type of person that you are. And it, it's funny because I got into college wanting to be a teacher. Right. And, you know, I don't, I, I'm not a huge fan of like the word coach and everything. I think, you know, I think we can teach more 
um, life lessons that we can teach more off the court in this profession that is deemed, you know, coaching. And I think that's a huge part um, for it. So, yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. It's funny just hearing you talk about, you know, learning and then sort of shifting the way that you went about doing things. And so when you think about that, before we dive into how you got, took your first step into coaching, I just want to circle back to just, you talked earlier too about how, you know, you're a big believer in habits. So when you, when you changed what you did, like just, just take your diet, for example. So when you said, Hey, I changed my diet, like what were you, what were you doing before you're eating like a typical college kid? Like you were probably, so I just, <laughs> for me, we used to practice when I was at Kent. So this is, I was there from 88 to 92 and we would have in the preseason, we would have these Saturday morning, like blue and gold games. So inner squad game, you know, it'd be statted and film or whatever. And the coaches would do it. So it'd be like three hours, get up at seven in the morning. So we'd be done at like 10. And then me and a bunch of my teammates, we would go directly from that practice to the local Ponderosa. And we would just, and we would literally sit in yeah. Ponderosa for like three hours and you're eating chicken wings and steak. I probably, I probably drank like a gallon and a half of soda and all this stuff. Yeah. And you just, you know, you just think back to that and I'm like, man, like, first of all, how dumb was it? Yeah. Secondly, at that point, it was like, we didn't really even know better. Like my coach, when we played, we, we were still eating, we would eat steak dinners for our pregame. Which, <laughs> and, and like, I was a kid who, for whatever reason, like the only thing I couldn't play on was pizza. Like you could feed mm. me anything else and I felt fine. It was normal. But now I look back on it and I'm like, man, if I would have, and I was the kind of kid who, if you'd have told me, I probably would have changed, but nobody ever said to me like, yeah. Hey, you probably don't want to drink a gallon and a half a pop after you play, you know, after you have a practice. And I was a kid who could you know, run and just, you know, I was playing all the time, whatever, yeah. I'm 20, yeah. 20 years yeah. old and you can For do sure. whatever you want, but it's just interesting. So what did you, so what did you change? Yeah. I'm just curious about how you went about making sure. those changes. I remember, uh, sitting in my dorm room, my freshman year and, um, uh, we'd go to Sam's club and Sam's club would have 36 packs of Mountain Dew and I'd buy <laughs> three or four of those things. And yep. I mean, I would drink those in three to four days. And, um, it's just, it, I talking to our guys now about it and drinking soda or not drinking soda or whatever. Like, and you just, you didn't even think twice about it, right? Like no, going to Ponderosa, you didn't think twice about it or nope. steak before games or whatever the case is. Like, you know, I just, those were the things and fast food and, you know, eating McDonald's or whatever the case was like, just not having any idea what, what, the fuel was that you put into your body, right? Like it was just, this tastes good. So I'm going to eat it or this is, you know, giving me energy or whatever the case is. And now knowing the science behind it, like, yeah, there's a reason that fast food does taste good because you know, <laughs> that, that's how they make money and it tastes sure. good so that you keep coming back and whatever. So, you know, when I, when I made the shift and changed my major and everything and decided to, you know, go, go all in, like, we, I dropped my, uh, I was living off campus, so that, that helped as well, but dropped my meal plan and, uh, told my family and told my parents and I was blessed to have this situation, but like, um, I wanted, you know, and maybe it's the most healthy food. I don't know, but I just want gift cards to Subway. And again, I'm a creature of habit and I'm weird and that's okay and whatever, but I ate the same thing for breakfast, lunch, and dinner for the two years of my college. And maybe, nice. I, I, like maybe we go out you know, for dinner one night or whatever. But, um, the subway ladies knew my name um, <laughs> because I would go every day at, at noon and get a sandwich. And then I would cook chicken and rice and vegetables for dinner. I'd eat a bowl of uh, protein cereal at night. And that's what I did every single day. And I did that in the summer. I did that, uh, in, you know, in the fall and the winter, I, I ate the same, uh, meal. Uh, we played on Wednesdays and Saturdays. So I ate the same dinner, on Tuesday nights and Friday nights, I'd go to Fazoli's and they'd have this, uh, because pasta gives you energy, right? <laughs> right. That's, that's what I thought. That was the healthy way, whatever. But I, I'd eat a, a, one of their chicken sandwiches with a side of pasta, um, every night before a game and ate the same lunch. And it I did that for two years. <laughs> so do you still, do you still have any of those tendencies now? Yeah, I do. I do. I, I'm a, I'm a weirdo for sure when it comes to that type of thing. Um, <laughs> what's your go, what's so, your go to, what's your go to? So I have, and again, I'm, I'm not, I'm not quite as, I'm not quite as healthy as you, but for a long time for basically probably since 
I don't know, this is probably since high school, my lunch and breakfast, and I'm a little bit more flexible now yeah. than I used to be, but my lunch and breakfast have been the same. So I eat Love it. a bowl of Cheerios with all brand, two or three, but depending on how hungry I am, it might be one bowl, it might be might be three, yeah. uh, with, with raisins on it and a banana and a glass of orange juice. That's my breakfast. And then my lunch is two peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, raisins, and a banana. And so Love if Love I it. have the opportunity, that's... That's my routine. And so everybody, it's funny, you know, I work in, obviously I'm a teacher and the people, you know, I'd sit in the cafe, sit in the, the teacher's lounge, people, you know, it took them a while, but after a couple of years, they're like, don't you ever eat anything else? Like, how can you <laughs> eat, how can you eat peanut butter and jelly? My wife, who used to like peanut butter and jelly now hates it because she's like, I can't look at you eating, you know, we've been married like 20 years. She's like, I yeah. can't, I can't look at you eating a peanut butter and jelly sandwich again. It's just, hey. I'll never, I'll never eat one again. So <laughs> hey, I'm telling you, it takes, and, and before I get, get into that and the details of it, like in this, I, I really dug into it for people like Steve Jobs and learning right, things the, right, about the what outfit, they do. Right. Pick right, out like the, the outfit, outfit, right? Yeah. Just Why? take it off your because plate. Like he, yep. it's something he doesn't have to think about. For sure. And if you can, yep. you know, James Clear and his book, Atomic Habits is one of my favorite and life changing books. If you've never read it, Great but book. like it, it Tom, like habits are so key. And if you can develop habits and just, you know, the healthy habits where it just happens automatically and you don't have to think about it, like it, it frees up so much mind space that allows you to worry or focus on what something else. Right. Yep. So yep. for me, it, I, I intermittent fast, so I don't eat until noon. I eat from noon to 8 p.m. And okay. that's my time frame of eating. And from so when I wake up, I, I allow myself to drink as much coffee as I want from, you know, 4.30 or 5 a.m. To, to noon. And I can drink as much coffee as I want. It's all black coffee. Um, that doesn't, quote unquote, break a fast. Right. Um, so, yep. so I, I probably drink way too much coffee, but, um, <laughs> and my wife and everybody makes fun of me and, and whatever, but I know you gotta have, first, you gotta have one I vice, know. man. You gotta have know, one vice. Come I on. Know. I, I, I know the first 1500 calories that I put in my body every single day. Um, it's it, whether we're traveling, whether we're, you know, on a road game or whatever the case is, or it's a Sunday and we're off or it's Tuesday and, you know, it, it's something else is going on. So I, I know the, the smoothie that I make, I know exactly the, uh, the what's in it, the nutrition, nutrition, um, breakdown. I know the bagel with peanut butter that I eat. I know the <laughs> energy balls that I have at, at two thirty. So it's, it's really weird. Like people, you know, give me so much crap about it and whatever. I, I it's don't good care. to be weird. That's how I feel it too, is, man. It people, is. I don't, I don't care at all. I know I exactly agree. what's in my body. I know the, the, the breakdown of it. I know it's going to, I'm going to feel good when I eat yep, it and I know yep. I'm going to like it. And yep. I've been doing that, um, for the last, uh, three years or so, three, four years. So, yeah. uh, <laughs> you've taken, you've, you've, taken maybe, you've taken, you've taken my weirdness to a whole nother level, man. I'm, impre I'm, I'm you impressed. Maybe, you know, I'm maybe impressed. You, maybe you, you know, on Christmas morning, maybe I, I break it and I eat, you know, coffee cake or something with the family, right. but, yep. Yep. um, it, it's pretty consistent and it, it, it really comes back to, it's a, I, it's a, mindset it's a competition that i have with myself and yep. um you know if you can make something competitive and you know i i love like the thought of stacking wins day after day after day after day and stacking you know just individual wins like win today and that's a that's a mindset like win this choice and everything is a choice and the choice to wake up early or the choice to you know sleep in is is a daily thing and the choice to make this you know protein shake or the choice to, you know, eat this fast food sandwich. Like I, I know what the right choice is. Now it's okay. Have the discipline to do that right choice. And that's a key part, um, that, you know, you want to, you want to instill good habits into your players, right? Like yep. that's what we want as coaches. Well, you, you gain a little bit more traction with them when your actions and your words match up. Yeah. You know, maybe I, I'm not, you know, lacing up the shoes on Wednesday and Saturday nights to play. But, you know, I tell them they need, to, or we, we say, Hey, let's get extra shots up or, Hey, your individual workouts, you know, on Tuesday, Thursdays. Well, you know, they, they're putting in the extra work. Well, they need to see us as a staff putting in the work too. So we need to be living a healthy lifestyle. We need to be working out. We need to be trying to get better, not just watching the film, but you know, those actions need to match up with what we're asking of them as well. And I think that's key to it. And, you know, just the choice of what you eat every single day or, you know, whether it's healthy or not healthy, like I, 
I think that matters. And I, that's a, that's a personal choice and, you know, right or wrong. I, I, I think that does. That, that self-competition or almost that gamification of your life, I can totally relate to that. And I think if that's something that you could instill as a coach, if you could instill that in your players, yeah. to me, I feel like that's a trait that any player could benefit from because then you're looking at, you're just, you, you can look at so many things as I'm competing against myself and mm. what did I, what did I do yesterday? Can I match that? Can I do even better? Can I, yeah. what's my, what's my long term? what's my long-term goal? Can I get to 50,000 shots this summer? Whatever, you know, whatever it is, yeah. if you can gamify it to me, I, that's something that I've always done from the time I was a kid. And I do think that there's a tremendous amount of value in that. And if you can, if you can put that into your players, if you could somehow yeah. instill that in them and show them through just being by, by the way yeah. that you are, just do it by example or actually talking them through it. And if they really take it to heart, I think you could see a lot, no a lot of benefit to yeah. that for yeah. sure. There's a, there's a quote that I, I love and I heard this a few years back from some pretty influential people in my life. And it was, uh, when you know who you are, you don't have to worry anymore. It's true. And I think that's like, that's so true, right? Like yeah. it takes all you know, any voices from social media or people saying you're doing this wrong or you should be doing it this way. No, like I know who I am and I, I am good with that. So whether you agree with, you know, the way that I work out or the way that I start my day or, and I'm not saying you, I'm just right, using I understand. that as a, as a, as a, you know, example, right. Or whether you think I should be eating this or whatever, like when, when I know who I am and I'm confident in that and I know that there's a foundation to that, um, I don't have to worry about that. And, you know, in today's society, in today's world, like there's so many voices that guys are hearing. I know we talked about that a little bit earlier, like they're being drawn in so many different ways. Like they need to have a solid foundation that they can fall back into. It's like a boxing ring and the boxing ring, you know, there's ropes around the ring. And that that's a, it's a, from the, uh, a book that I've read before that talks about, your values and who you are are those ropes and life is going to throw you against those ropes and are your ropes strong enough to, you know, they're going to give a little bit, but eventually you're going to get pushed back into the middle of the ring. And that's a great visual for myself and for that we use with our guys. And, um, that I've talked to, you know, starting to talk with my kids about now is for like, sure. what are those ropes that surround your boxing ring? And you got to be able to get back into the middle of the ring um, to be able to, you know, figure out what the next punch is that you need to throw or you need to adjust or whatever the case is. So, you know, I think that's that, that comes back to what choices you're making and what your habits are on a daily basis. Absolutely. If you can instill, and I'm thinking about this as much from a parent standpoint as I'm a coaching standpoint, but if you could instill in your kids that confidence to be who I am, especially when you think about the peer pressure and the, the things that kids yeah. are exposed to, whether you just think about drinking or you think about drugs, or now you think about the trouble they can get into on a phone. If you can instill in your kids that, Hey, who are you and what yep. do you stand for? And what are you yeah. all about? And then you can allow yourself to, to float around in those circles and still understand that that's not, that's mm. not me. I can be, you know, I can be exposed to these things. I could be at a party and people could be drinking, but I know that that's not something that I'm going to do. And mm -hmm. I have the confidence to stand there and have 20 people come up to me and say, Hey, you want a beer? You want a drink? And you can just say no. And yeah. that's not easy. That's not an easy level of confidence to have <laughs> yourself or to instill in, instill in your kids as a, as a parent. But I think that's, yeah. you know, to your point, those are conversations that I think anybody who's a leader, whether you're a leader as a parent or you're a leader as a coach, like mm. that's the type of player or kid that you want to be able to develop is one who knows who they are. And therefore, as you said, they're not, they're not having to make a decision about should I do this or shouldn't I already know who yeah. I am and I'm not going to, and I'm not going to do those things yeah. or I am going to do those things when you talk about positive habits. So yeah, that's right. Those are all, those are all great yeah. points. Yeah, for sure. For sure. That's good. All right. Let's jump into your first coaching job. How does it come yep. to pass? What, what happens? How do you get, how do you break into the coaching profession? Yeah, no doubt. Um, that's a great question. Um, so graduated, um, college in, um, May and got married in June 
and uh, so two weeks, bang bang, and gotten, <laughs> <laughs> like I, you're ready, I mean, you're ready to be an adult. Like, you ready, go from a, you go, from, you go from a student to you're an adult. I was blessed. My my wife is awesome, and I I am I it, it yeah I'm I'm the luckiest they're out there. But um, so got married, and you know I got a job, and I used my degree um, to become like a, a sports trainer, specific you know speed agility. So I was able to do that for six months, and then got, you know, real, another real job and um, was like a athletic director at a um, youth sports organization. So I did that for two and a half years um, out of college. And what I learned in that situation of how to talk to parents and how to schedule and how to run a budget. And um, it's just, it's really cool to look back and see, okay, why was I, why did we do that? And it's just how, how it all lines up and um, the, the opportunities that that job presented itself. I thought that's what I was going to do you know, the rest of my life, I had, I had wanted to get away from basketball, like we had talked about, push it aside a little bit. And then my wife kept telling me, like, you're a coach, like, you need to get into coaching, you need to get into coaching and um, got a phone call one day. And this goes back to just just how it all lines back up um, from making the college decision and the relationships that you build. Um, I got a call from uh, Joel Cotton. He was uh, the head coach at Judson University in Elgin, just outside of Chicago. And uh, I had actually, Coach Cotton was the assistant coach at Anderson who recruited me um, out of high school. So the fact that I made the decision to even go to Anderson in the first place, um, Coach was there for uh, two seasons and then he left and they moved to Chicago. Um it's just crazy how it all comes full circle. So he called me and he said um, he had a, a GA, um, it, Judson's an NAIA school, um, small Christian school, um, 800, 900 students. Um, he had a GA uh, assistant coach position and wanted to know if I'd be interested. And I'm like, yeah, like I would. Like, this would be <laughs> awesome. And he's like, hey, he's like, come up. It's like, bring Erica, your wife up. Let's talk about it. Visit the school, visit the campus. Let's do this thing. So went up there and um, had an awesome experience, you know, talking to him, just reconnecting one. Um, he, he's one of the, the biggest mentors of my life now. But so he was the head coach, athletic director. Um, the other assistant coach who was who was leaving, um, Jordan Delks was um, there and he was um also a former player at Anderson. So I knew him. So it was really cool to reconnect with those guys, but they, they showed us around, they talked and uh, we're getting ready to leave. And coach is telling me, you know, uh, what the position breakdown is. And he says, um, you know, it's a two year agreement and this is what it's going to look like. And this is what it's going to pay. And he told us that dollar amount and um, that dollar <laughs> amount didn't, didn't line up, didn't line up with, when, when you look at rent and what it costs to live um, in the Chicagoland area, it just didn't make sense. And, but so we, we, you know, we got in the car, drove home, drove the five hours back home and prayed about it and talked about it and just was like, if this is what we need to do, this is what we need to do. And um, it was within, you know, two, three hours of, of just talking and praying and everything that, we were like, yeah, like, this is it. This is what we need to do. It, it's going to work out. I don't know how, but this is, this, is, this is what our next calling as a family and for myself selfishly um, needs to be. So um, we made the, made the decision to move up and um, it was, you know, the two and a half most influential years of my life now um, and moving away from family. And it was, you know, it, it was awesome. And it was a school with not a lot of resources. It was a school with uh, not a lot of, you know, recognition. And, you know, I had to get a CDL to drive the bus, you know, to games. <laughs> and uh, it, it's just, it's crazy uh, what, it, what it all entailed. But the opportunity that it presented to learn and dig into it. And that was something that Coach Cotton talked about is like, you're going to get to do scouting reports. You're going to get to do individual workouts. You're going to get to see a budget. You're going to get to be you know, on the road. You're going to get to do everything. And that was the break into coaching. You know, I think, you know, you can go two different ways almost. You can either, you know, go to a big school and be a manager, right. And get into coaching that way. 
and then try to move up and get a GA position or whatever the case is. Or, you know, a lot of times if you're a former player, you know, and you want to get into coaching at the division three or NAI or even division two level and then try to work up. And that was the route that I took because of the opp- opportunity to play in college. Um, and I, don't, I wouldn't change it because I got to dabble in everything. I got to dabble and I'm still getting to. And um, that's still the, the perk at this level is like we get to do, you know, travel. I get to do, you know, meals. I get to do, uh, you know, individual workouts, the strength and conditioning, the academic grade checks. You get to do so much and you just learn so much and you just have a ton of opportunity to build relationships with the staff and the other coaches and your managers and things, but just the guys as well. And you get to, you know, check in on their grades, but you also then get to go, you know, spot them on the bench press. And then you get to go, you know, put them through an individual workout. And then you get to go, you know, talk to them during study tables. And um, so that, that was the break and the opportunity um, to get into coaching, um, you know, back in 2015. So first question is how did you make that work with, be, I'll, I'll just use the word meager. We don't have to yeah. throw a dollar amount on it. How did you make it work with, how did you make that work with you and your wife? How, I just, how did you pull that off financially? I'm always interested in the stories yeah. of uh, how, how, how you pull that off. Yeah. I was working uh, three jobs, um, doing some, uh, early morning, uh, CrossFit training at a, at a gym that I was able to get into and, um, develop some good relationships with was doing, um, then going, so was teaching five, six, seven a.m. classes, going to the office after that. Um, and then in the evenings, you know, had the opportunity to do some training with some kids. Okay. Um, so some individual basketball workouts. Um, so we were just, you know, <laughs> trying to figure out what to do. Figuring it out, right? Figuring it, it out day to day, right? And, and when you, and when you have relationships with really, really good people, I'll be, you know, I mean, it, it wouldn't be right not to say that, you know, coach cotton and just the impact that that not just himself and his family had on us during those two and a half years like that we wouldn't be here today without them and you know i'm very grateful for that and you know the people in your life shape who you are and you know the impact that he had on my life is is crazy to to think about and knowing that he came to a game in high school and I remember seeing him the first time and I'm like, I don't want to go to the school. So who he is now in my <laughs> right, life, right. And just the impact that he had. Um, it's just, you just laugh, right? Like you just laugh and be like, this doesn't make sense, but that's just the beauty of life and what it all entails. And um, so just, you scrap by, you figure out ways to, you know, you get creative with your budget and you get creative with different jobs and different opportunities. And, you know, you, you, you know exactly the food that you're eating and you're, you're creating those habits and you're doing those things. And, um, yeah, I mean, that was the biggest thing is, um, just, just making the, the necessary choices and the necessary, I don't, I don't like the word sacrifice, but those decisions that you have to make to be like, yeah, like this is what we want to do. So let's do it. Whatever it takes, let's just get it done and have that mindset each and every day. What'd you love about coaching right away? Like what, immediately obviously you hadn't coached before so you jump into it what piece of it did you did stood out for you in that in that first year where you're like man this is this is really what i want to do specific to that program i think that really got my itch was the practices were so competitive we we did things with you know no out of bounds and um you know guys just pushing and shoving and going crazy and guys diving on balls and shoving each other in a competitive way though like It was, it was drawn out of them, um, in a positive way to push each other and to just the energy that that brought. Like, you know, I I remember college practices were maybe a little bit different, you know, five years ago when I, or when I was playing to what it looked like there, I was like, yeah, like this is it. I think when you're, when you're competitive, you're competitive, you know, the rest of your life. I don't think you can turn that switch off and being out of basketball for, you know, those three years after graduating and then getting back into it, it was, yeah, like I want to be competitive. I want to, you know, lace them up and I want to jump into this, you know, practice or I want to be competitive on the uh, recruiting trail or I want to be competitive, you know, in this workout or that workout and just the opportunity to, to do that and to see that, but then to dive into those guys. And, you know, I remember 
you know, 9 p.m. study tables and talking to them and having the, you know, conversations with those guys that, you know, I got phone calls from them, you know, from some guys on the team at Judson a couple of weeks ago and just talking to them and hearing the stories and, you know, that that's what it all, that makes it all worth it. Absolutely. I think those relationships and I've often said that those calls that you get from former players and you pick up the phone, they're like, hey, coach, I don't yeah. think there's anything much more meaningful than that when you think about being able to use the game of basketball to make an impact on people's lives. And we all yeah. love the game and, and the opportunity that we have to use a game that has been so good to us to be able to have an impact on young people, I think is probably the most valuable thing that any of us could do as coaches. And it's one of the most rewarding things. Those phone calls are, yeah, are awesome. Sure. They're, sure. they're, they're awesome. Yep. All right. So after you're there, you're two and a half years at Judson, explain how you get to Laura's, how do you get hooked up with Chris and what you've obviously been yeah. there now for what, this is your sixth year. Yep. We're in year so, six now. So, so yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Tell yeah, the story. So, um, year two at Judson in between year one and year two, another way to, to one, make money and, you know, quote unquote network. And I, I'm not a huge fan of that word either, but, um, to network and just build relationships and to, and to grow as a coach, um, had the opportunity to coach AAU and got into AAU. And like, that was my first real vision of what AAU was turning into. And, um, so was, was coaching with a, with a program out of Wheaton, Illinois, um, and diving into that and, got just connected with those, with that family and the, those individuals. And, um, at that time, you know, at that April, May, June timeframe, um, the position, the head coach at Loris opened up and got filled and, uh, coach Martin and I had some common connections. I, we knew each other. Uh, we now knowing who he is and, um, the people that, that he knows and the recruits that he had, it's just funny. Like we never had a conversation before then it's just funny how we did it um, <laughs> right. but so just he was he was recruiting a player after he got the job at Loris he was recruiting the son of uh, the program director and um, had the opportunity they ex threw my name out there and to him and by the grace of God and just goodwill I, I don't know why he, he gave me a phone call and I don't know what I said or um, <laughs> maybe the other guy screwed it up I don't know but um, came up on a, on a interview with him and, um, his energy and passion. And I just remember leaving the interview and leaving the conversation, um, and calling my wife and being like, that dude gets it. Like that guy is passionate. That guy's energetic. He's crazy, but he has a vision and he knows what he wants. And if, if I have, if if there's just a brief moment that he's even thinking about offering it to me in a conversation the next time, I'm not going to let him even think twice, and I'm going to take it. And um, and that was a that was a turning point, and um, I'm grateful to this day for that and um, what that opportunity presented itself. When you think about the time that you've been with Chris, what are some things that you take away that one you think have led to the success that you guys have been able to have been able to have and then two to go along with that what are some things that if at some point you were to get an opportunity to be a head coach some things that you've taken from him that you will take with you for the rest of your coaching career yeah. so i guess what yeah. what leads to your success and then what do you think you're going to take with you if you ever get an opportunity to to have your own program for sure i think uh you know i think any any assistant like you need to learn as much, right? Like you need to, yeah, be able to suggest, you need to be able to, uh, you know, add some value. You need to be able to take the, the workload off your head coach as much as possible. And you need to add value to the program, but, um, you also need to sit back and you need to learn as well. Like he's, he's in that chair for a reason. He has put the time in, he has earned that position. And, um, I coach Martin is, I've said this before and I, and I say this quite often and he is one of the greatest leaders I have ever seen. And it, it's done, you know, maybe differently than what people see or what people think or whatever the case is, but he is able to um, build a relationship. He's able to uh, get you to buy in. He's able to hold you accountable. He's able to motivate you. 
He's able to, you know, tip you over, but he's able to pull you back up. And he can do that with, you know, the best player on our team and the worst player on our team. And I think that, you know, is definition of a great leader. If you can do all those, you know, sometimes a, a head coach can, you know, be a, a, a motivator and, but he can't, you know, have a good relationship. Well, sometimes you can have a good relationship, but you can't be a motivator. And sometimes you're, you're too much of a friend and sometimes you're, you're too crazy or whatever the case is. Coach does an <laughs> awesome job of blending those two things. Um, and that's, that's such an awesome thing to see day in and day out the way that he communicates. And, um, I'm blessed that, um, to, to be alongside of him and to, you know, help him out however I, I can. Um, but those are some things that, you know, he probably doesn't know that he's teaching me or that he's doing, but those are some of the strongest traits that I think a leader can possess, whether you're a coach or whether you're a fortune 500 company owner, or you're, you know, the CEO of this business, or you're a dad or whatever the case is, if you can find different ways to motivate, to inspire, to build a relationship, to hold the person accountable, I think that encompasses everything that you could, you could see and you could do. And I think that's key. And those are some of the strongest things that he can do. Do you guys have conversations? Do you ask him about, Hey, how do you, how do you do that? How do you motivate? How do you become a leader? Are those conversations that you guys are having together about how that's done? Or is it more something of you're watching, you're observing, you're trying to, pick up the cues of things that he's doing and seeing. I'm just curious as to how that, yeah. how you, how you approach that. And obviously there's probably a little bit of both in there, but just, I'm just curious about how that relationship, when you guys are sitting in the coach's office, what do those conversations look like in terms of you learning from him and, and, and those kinds of, those types of conversations? For sure. For sure. I think, I think it's more so, uh, an organic conversation than it is, Hey coach, how do you hold this guy accountable? Or, um, what do you think here? Whatever the case is, like, I think it's more organic. It's, um, he is such a, a driven and passionate and he wants to win, you know, at, at all costs, right? Like to, to an extent, don't, don't get me wrong on that, but like, he wants to do that, um, and be, you know, one of the most successful programs. Like we, we say it all the time. We want to, we want to run a division one program at the division three level. And we want our end goals to win a national championship. Like that's what we say. But we also realize as coaches, there's, there's a lot more into that. Like we just talked about getting phone calls from former players and, you know, having a Snapchat group of former players or having, you know, text messages from other, from former players. Like that that's all in alignment. And I think if you can narrow down your focus and you can eliminate the noise from the outside and coach does a good job of this, of like, what's important, you know, what are the five most important things in my life? And to see him, you know, take 30 minutes and, you know, have his kids come and eat lunch with him or, you know, after a game, the kids are running on the floor or whatever the case is, but also seeing him at practice, you know, holding the guy accountable because he didn't close out with the right hand or whatever the case is like you, I get to see that as, as examples right in front of my eyes. And that's, that's, I think more valuable because those are um, the words and his actions matching up to what he wants to be and the type of coach that he wants to be and the type of father that he wants to be. And then, you know, those are, that can then lead into conversation in the office of like, Hey, you know, what was going through your mind when, when you said this to him, or, you know, maybe he says, Hey, Gabe, how would you handle this situation? Or what are your thoughts on this type of guy? Or what should we say to him? Or how can we motivate this guy? Because, you know, the 15 guys on our team or, or however many that is, each guy's going to be motivated differently. And some guys need, you know, yelled at and some guys need to be coddled a little bit and you have to be able to, to know who they are, but also, you know, almost throw darts at them and not, not you know, more <laughs> symbolic than anything, but like, let's try this. Okay. That right. didn't work. Let's try this. Okay. That didn't work. Let's try this. Okay. That didn't work. Let's try this one. And eventually hopefully that dart sticks and you, you learn the darts by, by learning, by talking, by reading, by listening to others. And, you know, I think that's something that he does really well is 
also is, you know, he's, he's digging into books. He's digging into podcasts. He's, you know, applying things that he's learning and saying, Hey, let's try this drill or let's do this, or let's do this leadership book or this, let's do this, whatever the case is, you know, just seeing the example that he sets, I think is, is more organic than just, you know, sitting down and saying, Hey coach, how'd you hold this guy accountable? Um, or what, what were you thinking here? Right. You see situations that occur and then you're having conversations and you're talking it through. Yeah. And in the course of doing that, that's how you're picking up. And I'm sure just like you're learning from him, I'm sure he's learned from you in terms yeah. of just having those ideas, be able to bounce back and forth off of yeah. each other. To me, I think that's, those are always valuable conversations. I used to love, that's probably one of the things I miss most about not coaching a team anymore is, you know, when I was a high school assistant, you just sitting in the coach's office after practice or after a game and just talking about, Hey, this guy, or Hey, what could we have done differently yeah. here? Or just, you know, those are the conversations where you really grow and you learn and you think about the time that you've been there. How have your, how have your responsibilities changed if they have at all since you first got there? Have you gotten more responsibility, different responsibilities? Has your role shifted in any way? Just talk a little bit about the evolution of your position there. Yeah, definitely. You know, I think coming in, it, it was, it was an awesome opportunity as a, as a younger coach, um, working with a first year head coach with coach Martin and being able to, to see, to help, um, build a program from the ground up, right? Like the, the school is, is an awesome, uh, is in an awesome location. It has other very, very successful athletics programs. And the school was set up to be successful. And, um, you know, I think that's a key thing in, in jobs and everything is the type of resources or whatever the case is. Like, it, it was really cool and it's been awesome over six years to see, you know, our, our Duhop commitment and our values and things, you know, that we talked about in, in meeting number one you know, as a staff and, you know, sitting down at a Starbucks in the Chicagoland area and talking, recruiting with him and just seeing the evolution and the development of a program from day one. And I've been blessed, you know, to, for, for him to give me, you know, different jobs, um, over, over the course and whether that's, you know, in, in charge of recruiting or the, the recruiting coordinator, you know, that's kind of the, the role that, that I was able to take on from day one of, you know, the database and the contacts and, Hey coach, you should, you know, go see this guy, or we need to see this guy, or this is where we're at with that or whatever the case is and developing that, um, along with, you know, the strength and conditioning and along with, uh, you know, game planning and scouts and, and everything. And I think, you know, over, over the course of six years, any, any good, and I'm not saying I'm good whatsoever. There, there are many, many better, better assistant coaches than I am. But any any good assistant, no matter what job you're in, you start to learn your head coach, and you start to learn. You know, I know I know what coach wants to see, right? To to an extent, I know you know the type of things that you know he's going to be like. No, I don't like that, or I like this, or you should put it here. Hey, what font is that? Like, <laughs> I'm, it's crazy, right? Like, no, the it makes sense. Uh, the attention yeah, to detail totally is, is yeah. key. Like, you know, and I, I, over six years, you learn those tendencies and I think it, you develop trust. And, um, you know, if, if I keep turning in a scouting report that's in times new Roman and I do that for six years and coaches like, no, change the font to this. Like, this is what the font needs to be. And, you know, if I'm not doing that, I'm not doing my job. I'm not learning and growing and being like, I'm not making his job easier. And I think that's where, you know, I've been able to uh, adapt as well and, and being like, okay, he needs this. Okay. I'm going to give that to him or he needs this or he wants this. Okay. I'm going to do that. And I think that's what develops that trust that then he says, okay, now, okay, you did that scouting report. I trust you 100%. Let's go with that game plan. Um, you know, I think early on, you know, no matter, you know, what the relationship is, like maybe you might be a little bit weary of, of a, you know, this decision or that decision or he thinks this or he thinks that. But, you know, when, when you can prove your, your intentions are pure and your, your values are right, you know, I think that's key in, in developing that trust and, and, you know, believing in me that at the end of the day, my heart is 
for our program to be successful, for him as a head coach to be successful. That That's my end goal. It's not, I want to be the best assistant coach. No, it's like, I want this program to be awesome. Like that's, that's all I care about. I care about the guys in the program. I care about coach Martin and his family. And I think that's a, that's a key factor in what he's been, he's allowed me to grow and develop as an assistant coach. So if you were to give advice, let's say you're talking to somebody who was in your position from seven, eight, nine years ago when you're first starting out your career. And right now, if you could tell somebody what's the key or keys to being a successful assistant coach, you kind of just told the story, but maybe put them into one or two key bullet points that you think, hey, if you want to be a great assistant coach, these are the things that you need to do. And I could probably guess what they are based off what you just said, but yeah. I'm curious just to have you kind of lay them out. Yeah. I would say the the first one is, and I, I told Coach um, on on the interview, and 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 I, and I remember, and I and I tell him this often is he said is you know we we're, we're getting ready to finalize the 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 conversation, and I was getting ready to walk out of the office. He said, "Is there anything else you wanna you wanna say?" And I said, "Coach, I said I can promise you every day I'm gonna be loyal and I'm gonna have energy. Those two things. I I might not be the best." person to make a scouting report. I might not be the best individual workout person, but I can promise you, I will be 100% loyal to you as a head coach. And I will bring 100% energy every day. And that's something that is, is a value to me. Right. And I think that's key at in, in a younger coach or whoever in this profession, like if you can be loyal and that comes back to when you know who you are, you don't have to worry anymore. You know what your values are. You know what your head coach value and you can have energy. I think that sets you apart. I think if you can build that type of relationship with people and you're, you know, true to that, you're true to your values. I think that is um, a, a lost trait almost in today's society is that loyalty and that energy um, for a common purpose. I think that's key. Um, let's dive yeah. into the let's yeah, dive into the, dive into that loyalty piece because I think one of the things and I've said this once or twice on the podcast, but when I was an assistant coach, I worked for the same head coach at the yeah. high school level for I don't know, 12, 13 yeah. years, and many years after that, he came to me and we were having a conversation. He said the one thing that I always knew is that you had my back no matter what, yeah. and you were completely loyal. And I don't think I've ever gotten a more uh, I don't think I've ever gotten a compliment that made me feel better about what I had done in any walk of life, probably than that one. It was, it was more meaningful than just about anything I've ever heard. But a lot of times we hear that word loyalty tossed around. We say, oh yeah, we got to be, you know, coaches, assistant coaches need to be loyal. What does that mean in your mind when you hear that word? What does that, what does that entail? Yeah, I think the, 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 the brunt of that and, when when I'm a when I say I'm loyal to him and I'm loyal to this program is like I'm all in. Like every decision, you know, the fact that, you know, I know what I'm eating every single day or I know that I need to get a good night's sleep or I, I know what I'm telling this recruit. Every decision that I make is for the the program and for coach and to to move in the in the direction moving forward. Um, you know, am I going to agree with every decision that is made? No, but that doesn't mean I need to bad mouth him behind his back. Kind of like what you're talking about. Like I, I respect him at the end of the day, you know, he's going to make that final decision. But I think the, the words that I use or, um, the choices that I make that that's going to align with, okay, are you truly loyal or, or not? Like, are you, you know, doing this behind my back? Are you, you know, what are you telling the guys, you know, do you, you know, coach got on me at practice and the guys, you know, texting you later that night, like, <laughs> like, what are yeah. you saying? Like, are right, you, right. are you agreeing with the player? Are you agreeing with coach or are you saying coach was wrong or whatever the case is? Like who's, who's side. And I'm not saying you have to pick a side, but like, you know, you have to know the intent of your, your head coach's heart and you have to know what the, what the, meaning behind his decision was and you have to be all in on that and you know it's just like a any relationship whether it's marriage whether it's a head coach assistant coach whether it's a you know you know boss at, a, at another job like 
you have to know that the extent that the intent of his heart was pure, right? That he, he made the decision based on the the facts that he had and the feelings that he had and the experiences that he had. And you have to go all in with it. And you have to trust that he made that decision because he thought that's what the program needed. And um, I thought that was a, a big thing um, when it comes to developing loyalty over the course of, you know, each and every day. That's a really good answer. And I think when I, when people would ask me about that, I would always come at it in a similar fashion in that I kind of looked at it where there might be a disagreement behind closed doors. I might be able to have a conversation with my head coach and say, mm, I don't know if I mm. think of this or maybe we should try that. But ultimately, as you said, the head coach is the decision maker and they make the decision that is best for the program and their mind at that given moment. And then my job as an assistant coach is as soon as I walk out of that coach's office, that decision was not only my head coach's, but that decision yeah. was my decision. And anybody who asks me about that decision, whether it's a coach from another school, whether it's a player, whether it's a parent, whether it's an administrator, I'm a hundred percent supportive and behind that decision. Yeah. I'm not like, well, I wouldn't have done that. Yeah, that was, <laughs> yeah, that was really, you know, I don't know yeah. what he was thinking there. Yeah. And, and then I think the last piece of it too is, and, and I, I've never coached in the college level, so I don't know how prevalent this is or isn't, but you hear stories a lot on the high school level that because you don't have as much control in a lot of cases in your high school over who's on your staff, whether that's, you know, sometimes you might be able to get one person in as your varsity assistant, but, you know, the JV coach may be this person or maybe you got somebody from outside the building that's a freshman coach. And I've heard way too many stories of coaches that, you know, somebody gets hired as the ninth grade coach and suddenly they're bad mouthing the head coach to parents and they're start they start angling mm. for the job. And so I always looked at loyalty in addition to what we just talked about was I'm not trying to get I'm not trying to get your job. And yeah. and nobody's ever gonna think that that's what I'm that's what I'm trying to do. You will never hear any whispers of, hey, Mike's trying to go after that job. You know, he's just he's just waiting for this guy to make a mistake or whatever. Or yeah. man, he's not doing a good job. I should be the guy. I could do so much better. Or telling parents and those kinds of things. And it's just, I think loyalty. People on the outside hear it and they don't always understand yeah. it. I think you did. I think you did a really good job of clarifying for people what that what that means and and how important it is. I think mm. it's so important to you as an assistant coach, and I just think the value that that provides to a head coach, you can't even put it into words. Yeah, yeah. And I think you know, I, I, from the from the outside in, and I, we 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 hit on this earlier, and the voices that people hear, and you know, the comparison, and you know. For for our personalities in our program specifically here at Loris, like we're we're very you know energetic, we're very uh, outspoken, we're very um, just like let's get it right. And from the outside, we probably at times will rub people the wrong way, right? Because whether it's whether it's Coach Martin, whether it's me, or whether it's our players on the floor, like we'll rub people the wrong way. And I think that's 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 okay at, in, you know, athletics. Like if you're always doing something, you know, if, if everybody always likes you, right. There's that quote, like then you, you know, you right. Don't stand for anything. Exactly right. Exactly right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, and I, I think that's, that goes back to loyalty is like, and if coach rubs somebody the wrong way for our program, because he's standing up or he's being who he is, like, I know what his, what the intent was. I know why he did that. I know why he's, you know, clapping and getting excited on the sideline. I know why he's standing up for our guys. I know why, because, because of the decisions that he's doing in the office day in and day out and the voices and the people on the outside don't see that. And I think that's a, that comes back to the loyalty is like, I've got your back coach. Like, let's go. Like, I know why we're doing this. I know who we are. I know why we're doing that. And that's, that's the most important part of it all of, of it. And I think another thing that kind of goes along with that is, like our program may not be for you. Mm, you know yeah, what I mean? I yeah. think there's there's something to be said for that when you think about whether it's business or you're, you're listening to podcasts, or you read about, mm. hey, you know, you you may you may not like this particular thing. Well, guess what? It wasn't made yeah. for you. It's made <laughs> for the it's made for the people who are in our building every day, yeah. who are on our practice floor. That's who That's we're good. here for. And we That's can't really so. make everybody else happy. And I think it's I had a coach one time tell me a long time ago that 
you got to make decisions where when you go to bed at night, you can put your head down on the pillow and know that you made the right decision for you, for your mm. team, for your players. And you can't worry about the infl outside influences because if you do, you're never going to make anyone else happy. You're never going to make everyone yeah, happy. So good. if you try to if you try to make everyone happy, you're just going to be unhappy. So make a decision that mm. you know is the right one that you can be happy with that when you go and lay mm. down at night and put your head on the pillow that you can live with it. I think there's – there's something to be said for that. It's hard. It's hard to do sometimes. It's hard yeah. not to want to please everybody, but ultimately, I think the people who are the most successful are the ones who believe in their vision and believe in what they're doing, and then they go forward with that, and they don't let the outside influences affect the decisions that they're making because they've put together, as you said, they've planned, they understand the why behind the decisions that yeah. they're making, and that's ultimately, I think, I have success. Yeah, that's good. That'll preach right there, brother. <laughs> that's good. <laughs> well, I appreciate it. Hey, I want to wrap up. We're getting uh, to yeah. – uh, it's almost 1130 your time. I know you want to get a good night's sleep and you want to get up and get your coffee going tomorrow. So <laughs> I want to give you one more final two-part question. When you think about the next year or two, what's the biggest challenge that you have in front of you? And then number two, when you think about what you get to do every day, what brings you the most joy about getting up in the morning and going into – your office there at Loris? Yeah, I think um, that those are two really, really good questions. And kind of the, the first part, um, the biggest challenge, and I think this is for coaches or for anybody, is um, eliminating distractions, right? Like, and I think we're, we're in a, a crucial part of, of society and athletics or whatever the case is that there are so many things out there that's, trying to get our attention like they are digging into us and they're pinging us on our phone and they're emailing us or whatever the case is like they are trying to distract us and everything that i'm reading and learning and digging into right now is how do you eliminate those things and i think that's a that's a challenge right whether it's putting a time limit on certain apps on your phone or you know blocking this website or you know, turning your phone off at, you know, this certain time at um, the, the day or whatever the case is, I think that's a challenge. And I think that's, you know, comes back to who you are and why you do what you do is can you eliminate the unnecessary things in your life? And when you can eliminate those things and you can focus on, you know, two or three things, like you can set yourself up for success. And I think that's key. And um, kind of going into, into part two about, you know, what, that was the, the biggest the joy, biggest joy um, each and every day is one waking up and seeing my two boys. Um, I, that, that's a joy and um, having them, you know, running around the gym and everything, but showing up every day at Loris, um, it, it's like day one over and over again. Like I get excited, you know, yeah, maybe we lose this game, but to, to show up the next day and to say, Hey, what do we need to do to get better today? And I think that's a, that's a key component to, to who I am as an individual, but also who our program is and the opportunity to work with Coach Martin and just Loris, you know, administration from the top down is, um, is how can we get better? What can we do to serve our players? What can we do to serve the community? What can we do to, to serve this program to get to where we want to be, not just today, but tomorrow, and to set it up for sustainability over the course of the next two, three, four, five, six years, who, whoever knows how long, but um, doing it day in and day out. I think that's a, that's a joy. And when you have a firm foundation for who you are and why you do what you do, you know, going into work early and staying in late, it, 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 that's a choice. And that's a, that's an easy choice to make um, when you, when you know who you are. Getting to success is hard and maintaining success is even harder. Mm -hmm. And I think Amen. that what you just described fits that bill perfectly yeah. that you got to keep putting in the work every single day to get you, get you to where you want to go. Before we wrap up, I want to give you a chance to share. How can people reach out to you? How can they find out more about what you guys are doing at Loris? You want to share social media, email, whatever you want to put out there. And then after you do that, I'll jump back in and wrap it up. Perfect. Yeah. I'm uh, not, not huge on social media. I'm on Twitter um, at uh, Coach Gabe Miller. Um, I'm on there a little bit. You can uh, follow us on uh, Loris Men's Basketball social media at Duhawk MBB. Um, you can find all of our contact information 
um, on our website as well. But yeah, shoot me a DM or uh, cell phone is uh, 812-374-7558. If anybody wants to call or text, talk, whatever, um, would love to love to chat and um, build a relationship. Gabe, cannot thank you enough for taking the time out of your schedule, for staying up late with me tonight. Really appreciate it. It's been a lot of fun to dive into a lot of different topics with you tonight. Yeah. We got into some parenting stuff. Love and it. I always love getting into some of the entrepreneurial and habit type stuff that I like to listen to when I'm not listening to basketball podcasts. <laughs> so that was a lot of fun for me. Again, really appreciate it. And to everyone out there, thanks for listening. And we will catch you on our next episode. Thanks. Thanks for listening to the Hoop Heads Podcast, presented by Head Start Basketball.